I was in classes on business. I needed 60 miles of second grade four inch hemp rope. I build pontoon bridges and all the military rope in the empire goes through classes. What you're supposed to do is put in a requisition to divisional supply, who sends it on to central supply, who sends it on to the treasurer general, who approves it and sends it back to divisional supply, who send it on to central supply, who forward it to classes where the quartermaster says, sorry, we have no rope. Or you can hire a clever forger in Heronensis to cut you an exact copy of the treasury seal, which you use to stamp your requisition, which you then take personally to the office of the deputy quartermaster in classes, where there's a senior clerk who'd have done time in the state quarries if you hadn't pulled certain documents out of the file a few years back. Of course, you burned the documents as soon as you took them, but he doesn't know that. And that's how you get 60 miles of rope in this man's army. I took the overland route from Traecta to Serta, across one of my bridges, a rush job I did 15 years ago, only meant to last a month. Still there, and still the only way across the Lucin, unless you go 26 miles out of your way to Pons Jovianus. Then down through the pass, onto the coastal plain. Fabulous view as you come through the pass. That huge flat green patchwork with the blue of the bay beyond. And Classis is a geometrically perfect star. Three arms on land, three jabbing out into the sea. Analyze the design and it becomes clear that it's purely practical and utilitarian. Straight out of the field operations manual. Furthermore, as soon as you drop down onto the plane, you can't see the shape, unless you happen to be God. The three seaward arms are tapered jetties, while their landward counterparts are defensive bastions, intended to cover the three main gates with enfilading fire on two sides. Even furthermore, when Classis was built 90 years ago, there was a dirty great forest in the way felled for charcoal during the social war. All stumps, marsh, and bramble fuzz now. So you wouldn't have been able to see it from the pass. And that strikingly beautiful statement of imperial power must therefore be mere chance and serendipity. By the time I reached the way station at Milestone 2776, I couldn't see classes at all. Though of course it was dead easy to find just followed the arrow straight military road on its six foot embankment and next thing you know you're there please note i didn't come in on the military mail as colonel in chief of the engineers i'm entitled but as a milk face not supposed to call us that everybody does doesn't bother me i like milk it's accepted that i don't because of the distress I might cause to Imperials finding themselves banged up in a coach with me for 16 hours a day. Not that they'd say anything, of course. The rover pride makes themselves on their good manners. And besides, calling a milkface a milkface is conduct prejudicial and can get you court-martialed. For the record, nobody's ever faced charges on that score. Which proves, doesn't it, that Imperials aren't biased or bigoted in any way. On the other hand, several dozen auxiliary officers have been tried and cashiered for calling an imperial a blueskin, so you can see just how wicked and deserving of content my lot truly are. Now, I made the whole four-day trip on a civilian carrier's cart. The military mail, running non-stop and changing horses at way stations every 20 miles, takes five days and a bit. But my cart was carrying fish. Marvelous incentive to get a move on. The cart rumbled up to the middle gate, and I hopped off and hobbled up to the sentry, who scowled at me, then saw the scrambled egg on my collar. For a split second, I thought he was going to arrest me for impersonating an officer. Wouldn't be the first time. I walked past him, then jumped sideways to avoid being run down by a cart the size of a cathedral. That's classes. My pal the clerk's office was in block 374, row 42, street 7. They've heard of sequential numbering and supply, but clearly aren't convinced that it'd work. So block 374 is wedged in between blocks 217 and 434. Street 7 leads from street 4 into street 32. 
but it must be all right, because I can find my way about there, and I'm just a bridge builder, nobody. He wasn't there. Sitting at his desk was a six-foot-six rover in a milk-white monk's habit. He was bald as an egg, and he looked at me as though I was something the dog had brought in. I mentioned my pal's name. He smiled. Reassigned, he said. Oh. He never mentioned it. It wasn't the sort of reassignment you'd want to talk about. He looked me up and down. I half expected him to roll back my upper lip so he could inspect my teeth. Can I help you? I gave him the big smile. I need rope. Sorry. He looked so happy. No rope. I have a sealed requisition. He held out his hand. I showed him my piece of paper. I'm pretty sure he spotted the seal was a fake. Unfortunately, we have no rope at present, he said. As soon as we get some... I nodded. I didn't go to staff college, so I know squat about strategy and tactics. But I know when I've lost, and it's time to withdraw in good order. Thank you, I said. Sorry to have bothered you. No bother, his smile said he hadn't finished with me yet. You can leave that with me. I was still holding the phony requisition with the highly illegal seal. Thanks, I said. But shouldn't I resubmit it through channels? I wouldn't want you thinking I was trying to jump the queue. Oh, I think we can bend the rules once in a while. He held out his hand again. Damn, I thought. And then the enemy saved me. Which is the story of my life, curiously enough? I've had an amazing number of lucky breaks in my life, far more than my fair share, which is why, when I got the citizenship, I chose Felix as my proper name. Good fortune has smiled on me at practically every crucial turning point in my remarkable career. But the crazy thing is, the agency of my good fortune has always, invariably, been the enemy. Thus, when I was seven years old, the Hoos attacked our village, slaughtered my parents, dragged me away by the hair, and sold me to a Sheridan, who taught me the carpenter's trade, thereby trebling my value, and sold me on to a shipyard. Three years after that, when I was nineteen, the Imperial Army mounted a punitive expedition against the Sheridan pirates. Guess who was among the prisoners carted back to the Empire? The Imperial Navy is always desperately short of skilled shipwrights. They let me join up, which meant citizenship and I was a foreman at age 22. When the Edgemen invaded, captured the city where I was stationed, I was one of the survivors and transferred to the engineers, of whom I now have the honor to be colonel in chief. I consider my point made. My meteoric rise from illiterate barbarian serf to commander of an imperial regiment is due to the Hoos, the Sheridan, and the Edgemen. And, last but not least, the rover, who are proud of the fact that over the last hundred years they've slaughtered in excess of a million of my people. One of those here today gone tomorrow free cults you get in the city that says the way to virtue is loving your enemies. I have no problem with that. My enemies have always come through for me, and I owe them everything. My friends, on the other hand, have caused me nothing but aggravation and pain. Just as well, I've had so very few of them. I noticed I no longer had his full attention. He was peering through his little window. After a moment, I shuffled closer and looked over his shoulder. Is that smoke? I said. He wasn't looking at me. Yes. Fire in a place like Classif is bad news. Curious how people react. He seemed frozen stiff. I felt jumpy as a cat. I elbowed myself a better view, as the long shed that had been leaking smoke from two windows suddenly went up in flames like a torch. What do you keep in there? I asked. Rope, he said. Three thousand miles of it. I left him gawping and ran. Millspec rope is heavily tarred, and all the sheds at classes are thatched. Time to be somewhere else. I dashed out into the yard. There were people running in every direction. Some of them didn't look like soldiers or clerks. One of them raced towards me, then stopped. Excuse me, I said. Do you know? He stabbed me. I hadn't seen the sword in his hand. 
I thought, what the devil are you playing at? He pulled the sword out and swung it at my head. I may not be the most perceptive man you'll ever meet, but I can read between the lines. He didn't like me. I sidestepped, tripped his heels, and kicked his face in. That's not in the drill manuals, but you pick up a sort of alternative education when you're brought up by slavers. Sequence of thoughts. I guess the tripping and kicking thing reminded me of the Sheridan who taught it to me, by example. And that made me think of pirates. And then I understood. I trod on his ear for good luck till something cracked. Not that I hold grudges. And looked around for somewhere to hide. Really bad things happening all around. Take time to sink in. Sheridan pirates were running amok in classes. Couldn't be happening. So I found a shady doorway, held perfectly still, and used my eyes. Yes, in fact, it was happening. And to judge from the small slice of the action I could see, they were having things very much their own way. The Imperial Army didn't seem to be troubling them at all. They were preoccupied with fighting the fire in the rope shed, and the Sheridan cut them down and shot them as they dashed about with buckets and ladders and long hooks, and nobody seemed to realize what was going on except me, and I don't count. Pretty soon, there were no Imperials left in the yard, and the Sheridan were backing up carts to the big sheds and pitching stuff in. Never any shortage of carts at classes. They were hard workers, I'll give them that. Try and get a gang of dockers, or warehousemen, to load 200 size 4 carts in 40 minutes. I guess that's the difference between hired men and self-employed. I imagine the fire was an accident, because it rather spoiled things for the Sheridan. It spread from one shed to a load of others before they had a chance to loot them, then burned up the main stable block and coach houses, where most of the carts would have been, before the wind changed direction and sent it roaring through the barracks and the secondary admin blocks. That meant it was coming straight at me, by now, there were no soldiers or clerks to be seen, only the bad guys, and I'd stick out like a sore thumb in my regulation cloak and tunic. So I took off the cloak, noticed a big red stain down my front. Oh yes, I'd been stabbed, worry about that later. Pulled off the dead pirate's smock and dragged it over my head. Then I pranced away across the yard, looking like I had a job to do. I got about thirty yards and fell over. I was mildly surprised, then realized, not just a flesh wound. I felt ridiculously weak and terribly sleepy. Then someone was standing over me, a Sheridan, with a spear in his hand. Hell, I thought, and then, not that it matters. Are you all right? he said. Me and good fortune. How lucky I was to have been born a milk face. I'm fine, I said. Really? He grinned. Bullshit, he said, and hauled me to my feet. I saw him notice my boots, as she beetle crushers. You can't buy them in stores. Then I saw he was wearing them too. Pirates. Dead men's shoes. Come on, he said. Lean on me. You'll be fine. He put my arm around his neck, then grabbed me around the waist and walked me across to the nearest cart. The driver helped him haul me up, and they laid me down directly on a huge stack of rolled-up lamellar breastplates. My rescuer took off his smock, rolled it up, and pulled it under my head. Get him back to the ship. They'll see to him there, he said. And that was the last I saw of him. Simple as that. The way the looters were going about their business, quickly and efficiently. It was pretty obvious that there were no Imperial personnel left for them to worry about, apart from me, lovingly whisked away from danger by my enemies. The cart rumbled through the camp to the middle jetty. There were a dozen ships tied up on the other side. The driver wasn't looking, so I was able to scramble off the cart and bury myself in a big coil of rope where I stayed until the last ship set sail. Some time later, a navy cutter showed up. Just in time, I remembered to struggle out of the Sheridan smock that had saved my life. It would have been the death of me if I'd been caught wearing it by our lot. Which is the reason, one of the reasons, why I've decided to write this history. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have bothered, wouldn't have presumed. 
who am I to take upon myself the recording of the deeds and sufferings of great men and so on? But I was there, not just all through the siege, but right at the very beginning. As I may have already mentioned, I've had far more good luck in my life than I could possibly have deserved. And when, time after time, some unseen hand scoops you up from under the wheels, so to speak, and puts you safely down on the roadside, you have to start wondering, why? And the only capacity in which I figure I am fit to serve is that of witness. After all, anyone can testify in an imperial court of law. Even children, women, slaves, milk faces. Though, of course, it's up to the judge to decide what weight to give to the evidence of the likes of me. So, if luck figures I'm good enough to command the engineers, maybe she reckons I can be a historian too. Think of that. Immortality. A turf cutter's son from north of the bull's neck, living forever on the spine of a book. Wouldn't that be something?